Good afternoon and welcome to A Seat at the Sitting. Uh, as you've come to expect, we've gathered a great panel of experts to preview the remaining February Supreme Court docket in 90 minutes or less. Uh, I'm Nate Kazmarek, Vice President and Director of the Practice Groups. Per usual, all opinions on this program belong to our guests and not the society. We are very happy to have with us a talented uh, panel moderator and Alexandra Gazer. Alexandra, how are you? Great, thanks. Great to be here, Nate. Very good. I know you're in Ohio. Are you confident in Puxatawney Phil's early prediction of spring? You know, he doesn't predict an early spring that often, so I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here. Well, that's that's good and uh, wish positive wishful thinking. Um, exactly. <laughs> Alexandra is the general counsel at Strive. Before Strive, she was the director of regulatory <laughs> affairs at River Financial. Previously, she served at the U.S. Department of Treasury, first in the general counsel's office, and then as the youngest ever executive secretary, where she worked directly with Secretary Mnuchin. Alexandra was an associate at Aiken Gump, and she clerked for great judges before that. She holds a JD from the University of Texas, and her BA is from the King's College. A more complete bio for Alexandra and, and all of the uh, accomplished careers of our speakers are available for your review at our website, fedsoc.org. Our panel will cover the upcoming February cases, and then we'll go to audience Q&A. So audience, please think of the questions you'd like to stump our panel on. Questions can be submitted via the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will answer as many of the questions uh, as we can get to. With that, Alexandra, panel, thank you so much. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you. Um, as Nate mentioned, we have an incredible set of distinguished panelists here today. I will give you very brief bios so that we can jump right in to the meat of uh, the cases we're discussing here. So we have, uh, in the order they'll be speaking, Professor John Duffy, the Samuel H. McCoy II Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law, Allison Hayward, an independent analyst, Stephen Halbrook, Senior Fellow at the Independent Institute, John Maslin, Senior Litigation Counsel at the Washington Legal Foundation, and Scott Dixler, Partner at Horvitz & Levy, LLP. Professor Duffy? Yes, yeah, so our first case uh, for the February sitting is a really interesting case for any people who love administrative law, which I teach and write in, so I absolutely love this case. Um, the issue in this case is when does the right of action given by the Administrative Proce Procedure Act to sue an agency to seek judicial review, when does that terminate? In other words, how long is too long to wait to sue an agency? Now, you might think, well, this is kind of a trivial little issue. It's a statute of limitations issue. That can't really be such a big deal. This comes up all the time. It's coming up not just in this case, which deals, the underlying issue deals with suing the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve concerning swipe fees for businesses that have to pay uh, uh, transaction fees when um, debit cards and things like that are swiped uh, to pay for something. But it also is even relevant uh, among other sort of prominent pieces of litigation that are in the courts right now in the um, Texas or the challenges uh, in Texas to the FDA regulation of abortion pills, because many of those regulations are quite old. The people who are suing the agency, some of them are, are quite young, and therefore they can say, well, we didn't have a cause of action. No cause of action accrued to us um, until quite recently. So therefore, we still have a right to sue. Now, the relevant text of the statute, there is a statute uh, and there's a huge history uh, behind why this statute applies. I'm going to skip over that a little bit. But the statute says that every civil action commenced against the United States shall be barred unless the complaint is filed within six years after the right of action accrues. And accrues is a very important word in this statute. It's, I think, the central fulcrum that I think the court is going to spend a lot of time on figuring out exactly what that means. It's used in a lot of statutes of limitation, 
And it generally means that you, the, the concept of an accrual means when you can sue, when a, the individual who's before the court could have sued. And therefore, the calculation of the time period would seem quite simple. It would be figure out when this plaintiff, the person who's actually suing, uh, could have sued. If it's more than six years in the past, um, the person's barred and the complaint has to be dismissed for um, statute of limitations uh, grounds. Now, that's not the way the majority of lower courts have interpreted this statute. Uh, the majority of, of courts have said instead that the time limit, the six years, should start running from the time of final agency action. Um, now, that there's a lot of policy reasons, perhaps, you could articulate why that might be a good rule. It gives you certainty and uh, about what federal regulations are. At some point, they, they can't be challenged. Um, the problem, the real problem, I think, for the government in this case, uh, and I, I should say that uh, I and another professor here at the University of Virginia, Aditya Bamzai, have filed an amicus brief on the side of the petitioner. In other words, uh, on the side of saying accrual should mean what it means in every other context. It should, it should turn on when the person who's before the court had got the right of action. So we filed an amicus brief on that side and therefore against the government. But the, the government's view is that it should, the six year time period should start running at, at, um, at the time of final agency action. The real, I think, big difficulty, and this was articulated in an opinion for the Sixth Circuit by Judge Sutton, which created the split that I think has generated uh, the grant of certiorari in this case, is that um, there are two types of time limits well known in the law. One is called the statute of limitations, which typically runs from the time of accrual of the action to the individual plaintiff. The other is known as a statute of repose. And that looks exclusively to the defendant's actions and says the time limit starts from the challenge defendant's action. Now, these are two reasonable ways to limit causes of action, whether you're talking about an APA cause of action or tort suit or, or some other breach of contract suit or, or any kind of suit. The problem for the government here is that the word accrual is, is very strongly associated with statute of limitations that run from you know, the time of accrual. That's the that's the only really good way to say it. Um, the government's view is, well, it should start to run from the time of agency, final agency action. Um, that's what's going on in this case. I think it has enormous importance. Um, perhaps in the question and answer, I don't want to go on too long, even though I love this case, uh, because we have several other cases. Um, but th there's there's a huge, huge history, including why this statute even applies to the APA. The statute was uh, is a general statute that applies to any civil action against the United States. And for years after the enactment of the APA, it was not applied to administrative procedure cases and probably could not have been applied prior to 1976 to sort of really dig in history um, because prior to 1976, it was not legal to sue the United States by name in an administrative procedure act. You had to sue the officers of the, of the agency and seek injunctive relief just against them. So the statute didn't seem to apply on its face. In 1976, the Congress um, amended the statute to waive sovereign immunity, amended the Administrative Procedure Act to waive sovereign immunity and allow the United States to be named. And then after that time, you began to see the statute being used and the lower courts beginning to struggle with the meaning of this statute. It's finally that struggle with this statute has finally reached the Supreme Court. And I think it has huge implications. The APA is often uh, I think correctly known as a statute that that authorizes judicial review, that creates judicial review and tells you when you can start to sue the government after final agency action. But there's nothing in the APA about when you're too late to sue the government. And this general statute is, is sort of being scotch taped onto the APA. Um, and it has created some interpretive problems. Um, although I think the... Uh, the, the, the textualists on the court are going are gonna to find the issue in this case um, fairly straightforward, although there's huge other policy issues behind this. So I'll stop there, and uh, hopefully we can get lots of questions about administrative procedure.
Yes, um, this is a great reminder to please do put your questions into um, the Q&A bar. It should be at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question directed to a particular panelist, please go ahead and put that panelist's name in. We'd like to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, and with that, we'll turn to Allison Hayward. Yes, Allison, thank I, you. I, I needed to, yes, I, I did that. Um, you know, after like how many years we've been using Zoom and you still forget to unmute yourself, it's really, really depressing. Anyway, um, I'd like to talk today about the two net choice cases that are going to be heard um, on February 26th. Um, I think this should be an, a very exciting um, argument for um, court watchers, um, chiefly because Paul Clement is on the net choice briefs. And if he actually argues, um, you should really listen. Um, he is a master at the craft. Um, he's um, very impressive. And um, however you feel about, about the, the substantive arguments, um, he's just really, really worth listening to. Okay, so there's two cases here um, presenting about as on the nose circuit split as you can imagine. Both Texas and Florida in 2021 passed similar, not identical, but similar um, statutes um, to regulate the conduct of um, large internet platforms. Um, they required that the internet platforms um, have specific ways of doing content moderation. Um, they also um, have uh, certain reporting requirements, um, certain um, transparency requirements, and um, the Florida um, bill went up to the 11th Circuit and the 11th Circuit enjoined it. Um, it was the, obviously a, a pre-enforcement challenge um, making a, a facial case that um, these statutes violate the First Amendment. Um, the 11th Circuit enjoined because they believed they saw that the, um, that the parties here had likelihood of success on the merits. Um, the Fifth Circuit, not so much. Um, the Fifth Circuit, um, and this happened after the 11th Circuit's opinion, so they could benefit from the 11th Circuit's analysis. So the Fifth Circuit um, clearly stated that um, this statute would not be enjoined, um, rejected the 11th Circuit's analysis. Um, that, in turn, was vacated by the Supreme Court, interestingly, in a 5-4 decision to vacate the vacation, if that's a thing. And uh, so you can see that there's a lot of churn here um, providing a lot of interesting and possibly novel questions of regulating communications. Um, Texas, for its part, well, and Florida too, um, the, the states argue that um, they are permitted to regulate um, the conduct of these large platforms um, for various reasons, among which that they're common carriers. Um, they, are, they use a First Amendment analysis that also derives from a decision called Pruneyard, which was the court's interpretation of a, a California constitutional decision to require that um, shopping centers have allow um, petition gatherers, that they couldn't ban those um, people from their private shopping center. And, um, and the Rumsfeld decision, which you may recall involved um, whether or not law schools could bar um, military recruiters from recruiting law students. And um, both of those obviously look to limiting the speech of the entity that wants to censor in some way what kind of speech happens in its, in its jurisdiction. And um, the interest, I don't know. When I took, um, when I took um, regulated industries in, in, in college, um, you know, when you start talking about common carriers, you start talking about things like there's, there's natural monopolies or there's limits to competition that require additional regulation. And I think um, here, the states will have a bit of an uphill climb to um, establish that, that these large platforms are common carriers, um, not the least, of their problems has to do with the way these statutes identify which platforms will be regulated because they do it mostly by how many users these platforms have 
which means that you've got platforms as varied as Facebook, Pinterest, Yelp, Reddit, Discord, all seemingly coming under these um, requirements for uh, fairness in content moderation and non-viewpoint discrimination in content moderation. And these platforms, I mean, there, there's no common here in the common character. They take very vastly different approaches to how they do content moderation. And it's not clear to me at all that the states understood what they were doing when they were enacting these statutes. Um, I don't know if there's a constitutional requirement that you need to know what you're doing when you regulate something, but I think there should be a little bit. And um, moreover, I, I also am concerned about some of the um, va um, large, vast statements of constitutional liberties that the, that the platforms are making. Um, I think I think at the end of the day, with content moderation, what happens is that you have to do something very blunt, very quick. And so the notion that this is some expression of the platform's own view, I see with some skepticism. Um, I do think at the end of the day, um, if the common carrier argument fails, and I, I believe it should, um, though that's an argument. And um, if that fails, then um, the net choice um, parties are are probably in the clear to, um, and and these um, state laws won't won't prevail. Um, if the common carrier argument is adopted, there's still the second question of even as a common carrier, can't you assert terms of service onto your carriage? Um, you can. Um, just because a railroad is a common carrier doesn't mean that you can go on the railroad and refuse to pay and and pass, harass people and not you, you don't get to ride the railroad. You don't get to use a, a, a Facebook or Twitter or X um, in violation of the terms of service that you agree to when you sign up. There's sort of a contract there. And since what these laws are doing is prescribing different terms of service or um, forbidding certain terms of service, I don't know. I think that, that that's a complicated piece of this argument too. Um, I really, at the end of the day, um, the um, states also are, um, are concerned about how large platforms have become um, tools of of government oppression, um, the job owning case that's coming up um, states that more explicitly than this case does. But I think um, that is an interesting argument to make if you're trying to argue in favor of state control through statute by saying that there's state participation in the in the platforms that requires that. Um, I mean, they, they both um, are embedding state action into private speech. Con, con, conduct and I just I, I I'm not sure that's hugely persuasive, and then the final thing I will um, will say that that I don't see briefed anywhere. Um, well, two final things I'll say that I don't see briefed anywhere, but I might have missed them. Is censorship can happen at several layers of what they call the stack in in internet regulation. We're looking at the top of the stack. We're looking at the the app that someone is using to chat and post stuff. But there's other places in the stack where censorship or restrictions of, of access can happen. Internet service providers, uh, for example, um, the people who give you your domain name, um, servers, server farms. And this only deals with a bit of that. So when the private entities involved in internet communications decide that you're a dangerous person or they don't want to host your content. There's other places in the stack that are very equipped to take you off too. And so it's um, not going to solve the problem that the states have identified. And my final point that I didn't see briefed anywhere is because of the variety, and this, this would 
perhaps be a, a, an argument that the states could use because of the wide variety of approaches that platforms have in content moderation, a facial pre-enforcement challenge might not be appropriate because the, the issues that relate to a decentralized um, content moderation regime like you have in Reddit or Discord, vastly different from the very centralized content moderation you see in most parts of Facebook. And so the whole case may have been um, brought a little in, in, in some haste, um, but I haven't seen that argued. Um, I may have missed something. Anyway, um, there's a lot to dig in here and I hope I've been coherent enough um, to um, provoke some questions. Um, I do have a background in content moderation as well as, as a um, constitutional law professor. So um, maybe I can bring some of my own observations to light in the Q&A. Maybe, thank you. Thanks, Allison. I think I, you mentioned early on, you weren't sure whether it was possible to vacate the vacation. And I'm pretty sure anyone who has practiced law will tell you it is possible and it is likely. Um, and with that, we will turn it over to Stephen Halbrook. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to discuss the case of Garland versus Cargill. This is a very unusual case for the Supreme Court to take. It's really the first um, case the court has decided on a very technical issue in the definitions in the National Firearms Act, and it pertains to the definition of machine gun. Um, Chevron deference is supposedly not an issue. The government doesn't argue for that. And um, it's really the first um, case uh, of its type the court's ever taken. It's the second civil case the court has taken under the National Firearms Act. The only other civil case that the court uh, decided under the NFA was called Thompson Center Arms versus United States. It was a case that I argued and decided in 1992 favorably to our side. And that had to do with the definitions of short-barreled rifles. Um, one other pertinent case where the court had occasion to discuss machine guns was Staples versus United States. And that case, though, did not dwell on technical issues. It uh, had to do with mens rea requirements. Uh, if a person is in possession of an unregistered machine gun, um, what knowledge requirement has to be shown in the court in that case, in the opinion by Justice Thomas held that you have to, the government has to prove that the person, the defendant possesses a firearm as defined in the National Firearms Act. So the NFA defines a machine gun in part as a weapon that shoots automatically without manual reloading by a single function of the trigger. That's the definition that's at stake. And so e each one of those terms um, has technical implications that the ordinary person might not know. And in fact, it'll be interesting to see what the justices say, what questions they ask um, in terms of whether they all understand um, th these technical terms as applied to the device at issue. Um, so a bump stock is defined as a, uh, a device that one can take the normal shoulder stock off of one's rifle and uh, install this so-called bump stock. And what it does, the way it functions is um, when you pull the trigger and fire a shot, the recoil causes the middle part or the frame or receiver of the firearm to uh, recoil, to go backwards. And while you keep your your uh, non-trigger hand on the forward part of the stock, we call it the forend, um, the, the gun is fired, the action goes rearward, then it goes back forward again. And your finger is on this block uh, that the trigger comes forward to, and your finger pulls the trigger again. And it would only work if you maintain this manual pressure on the, the forehand with your non-trigger hand. So the issue is whether a bump stock is a machine gun. Now, for, for years, the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, 
said that a bump stock is not a machine gun because it's a non-mechanical device where you have to do more than simply maintain the, the trigger, um, the trigger pull, so that if you weren't maintaining the forward pressure on the, the forend, it would not fire more than one shot. But when it goes back and forth, uh, the action of the rifle um, and the trigger comes forward again, your finger pulls it again and, and it continues to fire. Um, so traditionally, these were just kind of uh, recreational devices that uh, people used and it would waste a lot of ammo that it was not accurate because the like it's a bump stock it's the rifles bumping back and forth so nothing much was going on with that issue uh the atf decided that a, a different device called the akins accelerator which was a mechanical device was a machine gun because it had a spring in it so that once you pulled the trigger back the spring would make the uh, action go backwards and forwards and continue to fire as long as the trigger was pulled back. And so they ATF distinguished a non-mechanical from a mechanical bump stock. So um, things were uh, uneventful until the Las Vegas massacre. And in that case, that, that shooter had used uh, several bump stocks attached to the semi-automatic rifles that he used. And it still hasn't been disclosed how many he used. Uh, all we know is that it was reported that some bump, bump stocks were used. And so that created, obviously, a controversy. Uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein proposed legislation to amend the National Firearms Act uh, to uh, add to the current definition that basically any device that makes the gun, a semi-automatic gun fire faster is a machine gun. Um, I testified personally against that because that would include things like uh, common upgrades to semi-auto firearms, such as um, a, a trigger job so that you have a match trigger that, that pulls easier instead of a, a, a heavy one. But the legislation went nowhere. And in fact, uh, and instead, the Trump administration directed ATF to um, adopt a rule, propose and adopt a rule that would add to the definition of machine gun in the National Firearms Act uh, to include bump stocks. And that's what, what ATF did, adopted the, the final rule in 2018. Um, at the time, um, it, it, it actually, it's the first time that ATF has ever tried to add a new definition to what Congress has enacted as the technical definitions of firearms that are restricted by the National Firearms Act. And so it was quite a bold move because normally, um, since the National Firearms Act had been um, adopted in 1934, the enforcement agencies had relied on the definitions that Congress adopted. And so here you have um, an important criminal statute, one with, with significant uh, incarceration um, potential for violation, 10 years in imprisonment. Um, for violation of something where at this point ATF is adding to the definition and so you have an attempt to add um, the, de to the definition of a criminal statute which is uh, something that's obviously off the table um, in, in the minds of, of many um, when we think about our separation of powers the legislature makes the law including the criminal laws in, in the um, in the um, final rule, ATF appealed to Chevron deference. In the litigation that ensued, ATF has dropped that. It, it says that it's a interpretive rule, not an, um, a legislative rule, so it's non-binding, although it would be kind of suicidal to violate that, uh, you know, to to not be in compliance with what ATF has stated, even as, if it's just an interpretive rule, because you're going to get arrested. Um, so uh, th there, a circuit split developed. The Fifth Circuit uh, in bonked the opinion. Uh, eight judges, uh, with the lead opinion by Judge Elrod, said that that um, on the merits, a bump stock is not a machine gun. 
there were other judges who joined uh, to with the results and said that according to the rule of lenity, uh, we interpret the law, the definition against the government because it's ambiguous. And so you've got the rule of, of lenity at issue here. You also have the, the merits of, you know, whether a bump stock is a machine gun. Um, it's not really a Second Amendment issue, although uh, some of the briefs did mention that, the, the fact that um, with, the, you know, the more recent Supreme Court decisions on the Second Amendment, that um, the, the ATF is, is going overboard with uh, um, re redefining terms and what Congress has enacted. So the, the bottom line, I, I expect the court to um, get to the issue of whether criminal statutes can be supplemented by agency um, regulations and, and, and extended, which I think the answer is likely to be no. Uh, and although everybody, we all know there's the Chevron deference issues before the court in, in another case, um, we'll have to see what the court says about it here, being that the government waived the Chevron argument and says that this does not raise a Chevron issue. So uh, I know my time's up. I'm sorry to go over for maybe a minute and uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and this is a good time to remind everyone to please put your questions in the chat. Uh, and with that, we'll turn it over to John Maslin. I'm here to talk about Cantero v. Bank of America. It's not as sexy as bump stocks or about some of the other cases that are being argued this sitting, but it is an important case. It deals with whether mortgage interest on escrow, mortgage escrow accounts are preempted by the National Bank Act. So about a dozen states have statutes that require mortgage companies to pay you interest on your escrow accounts for your mortgage. So obviously when you get a mortgage, in addition to paying your principal and interest, most mortgage companies require you to pay escrow. That escrow is then used to pay, for example, your insurance on your house and state and local property taxes. Well, these escrow accounts can grow quite large. They can be you know, three or four mortgage payments uh, at the end of the year. And so states like New York and California have passed statutes that say that the mortgage companies have to pay you 2% interest on your escrow accounts. And Bank of America uh, declined to pay that interest saying that the statutes were preempted by the National Bank Act. So the National Bank Act provides that uh, state laws are preempted if in accordance with the legal standard for preemption in the Supreme Court's Barnett Bank decision, the state consumer financial law prevents or significantly interferes with the exercise by a national bank of its powers. And so therefore the question is, you know, does this, do these, uh, interest on escrow accounts interfere with the powers of a national bank. Five years ago, the Ninth Circuit said that they do not, and they held that the California statute was not preempted by the National Bank Act. Here, the Second Circuit reached the opposite conclusion and said that the National Bank Act does preempt New York's interest on escrow account. And so the court grants certiorari to uh, resolve this circuit split. Uh, the first thing that the court's going to have to do is decide whether this statutory language that I just read, um, which was included in the Dodd-Frank Act back in 2010, changed the preemption standard. So before Dodd-Frank, you know, there was Barnett Bank and there was a line of cases defining when a consumer financial law or any state law really is preempted by the National Bank Act. What the plaintiffs and the government argue here, however, is that the Dodd-Frank Act changed the preemption standard. 
So although the statute says that a law is preempted if under the standard of Barnett Bank, which was a 1996 U.S. Supreme Court decision, you know, is preempted, they look at the other language in the subsection of the National Bank Act, which says the state consumer financial law prevents or significantly interferes with the exercise by the National Bank of its powers. So what the, what the plaintiffs and the government are arguing is essentially that uh, state law is preempted by the National Bank Act only if it's practically impossible to comply with both the state law and the National Bank Act and the National Banks Act, the powers that it gives to nationally chartered banks. Um, I think it's pretty clear that because the statute says that it's adopting the standard that's used in Barnett Bank, that that is the standard um, both before and after Dodd-Frank. Um, there's some dispute uh, with this case in particular about whether both plaintiffs are covered by the Dodd-Frank amendments. Uh, the plaintiffs and the government argue that they're not, that one set of plaintiffs is governed, governed by pre-Dodd-Frank and one uh, is governed by post-Dodd-Frank. I don't think the court's really going to get into that. My guess is that the, what the court's going to look to is whether under the current statutory language um, after Dodd-Frank that these interest on escrow accounts, interest on escrow account laws are preempted by the National Bank Act. And if they decide that they are preempted, then there's really no need to decide this issue about um, splitting the case pre and post um, Dodd-Frank. Um, the proposed rule by the government is quite odd in this case because there's a federal regulation that specifically says that this New York statute is preempted. Um, and yet, the Solicitor General and below uh, in the Second Circuit, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency filed a brief saying that this statute is preempted. But once it got to the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General's office decided to take a different view of the law. And in a footnote of their brief, they say, we know that there's this OCC regulation that says this uh, that this law is preempted by the National Bank Act, but that regulation is wrong, um, which is just mind-boggling, really. Uh, and there are dozens of briefs filed by the OCC and the Solicitor General in years past that uh, use the control test, uh, which is the test that the Bank of America is arguing for, which is essentially, does a state law control uh, power that the nationally chartered banks has under the NBA? If so, then it is preempted. For example, uh, two laws in the past dealt with ATM advertising and fees on nationally chartered banks gift cards that they issued. In both cases, the court said that those statutes were preempted by the National Bank Act, even though they didn't directly um, relate to a nationally a power that nationally chartered banks have. They controlled the exercise of a nationally of a power that the nationally chartered banks have. But I think that you're going to see a lot of pushback, not just from the right of the court, but also primarily from Justice Kagan with the SG's um, games here. And that's what they are. To, they are essentially trying to re repeal a federal regulation through a footnote in a Supreme Court amicus brief. And there's just no way that that's going to fly with the court. Um, I guess the court could say that the regulation conflicts with the National Bank Act. And so therefore, I'd be pretty surprised at that. I, I think that when you look at the text of the National Bank Act, even after Dodd-Frank, it's clear that the um, interest on escrow statutes are preempted and therefore the Second Circuit got it right. 
Um, a lot of the briefs in this case deal with the practical implications of the plaintiff's rule. Like I said, it's about a dozen states that have these interest on escrow statutes. And it would seem kind of weird to say that Bank of America, you have to pay interest on your escrow accounts for mortgages issued in New York and California, but you don't have to pay interest on escrow for mortgages that are in Texas or Louisiana. It would be an administrative burden on the banks. And that's kind of the purpose of the National Bank Act is to, to decrease the regulatory burden so that nationally chartered banks aren't having to comply with laws in all 50 states and every locality around the country, as long as they're complying with the laws and the regulations issued by the controller of the currency, uh, then they're good to go with respect to powers that the National Bank Act gives them. So I think this is gonna be a pretty straightforward case. I'd be surprised if there were less than um, seven votes to um, affirm the Second Circuit's decision here, um, but would be happy to discuss further. Awesome. Well, thank you. And I, I have to confess, as someone who's now in my 30s, uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a sexier issue than interest on your mortgage escrow. Uh, these are near and dear issues to all of our hearts. Uh, and with that, we'll turn it over to Scott Dixler. Well, hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for joining. And uh, I'll try to take up that invitation to find a sexier issue, although, you know, you you be the judge. Uh, so I'm here to talk about Coinbase versus Susky, which is an arbitration case. So try to control your enthusiasm. Uh, this is a case, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has taken a number of arbitration cases over the recent years. And a recurring theme in these cases, with some exceptions, has been rejecting efforts by either the Ninth, Cir the Ninth Circuit or the California State Appellate Courts to um, uh, read arbitration clauses out of contracts, read them narrowly, send disputes to court when the parties agreed to arbitrate them. And the Supreme Court has pretty consistently, uh, pretty consistently rejected those efforts. Uh, I suspect this case might be another in that line. Uh, so the question presented in this case, which I'm going to read, sounds very specific, but like some of the other cases today, this is uh, deceptively important and comes up quite a lot. So the question presented is whether where parties enter into an arbitration agreement with a delegation clause, an arbitrator or a court should decide whether that arbitration agreement is narrowed by a later contract that is silent as to arbitration and delegation. So there's a lot to unpack there. And it helps to think about um, how arbitration works and specifically how delegation clauses work. So under the Federal Arbitration Act, courts are obligated to respect uh, parties' decisions to arbitrate rather than litigate disputes uh, that arise um, under that particular contract. Um, so that that's simple proposition. Um, part, parties in recent years have increasingly included what the Supreme Court has called delegation clauses, which is when a when the question arises whether parties have agreed to arbitrate a dispute in the first place, should that decision be made by a court or should the arbitrability decision be made by the arbitrator in the first instance? So to increase the efficiencies of arbitration and to prevent litigation, which is the whole purpose of arbitration, parties have increasingly included delegation clauses in their contract, which say to the extent the parties dispute whether the arbitration clause applies or its scope, that issue should be handled by the arbitrator, subject to only the very, very narrow judicial review that the Federal Arbitration Act allows for. Um, so what happened here is that uh, the plaintiffs, uh, the defendant Coinbase is a cryptocurrency platform. And when the plaintiffs signed up for Coinbase, they agreed to terms of service that included an arbitration clause that said, we're gonna arbitrate all disputes with Coinbase. And the terms of service also included a delegation provision, which said that an arbitrator rather than a court would address any, dispute, any disputes over arbitrability. In other words, did the parties actually agree to arbitrate? Is there a valid arbitration clause? What's its scope, et cetera? Simple enough. Subsequently, these plaintiffs signed up for a cryptocurrency sweepstakes that Coinbase ran. And that sweepstakes had its own terms of service which had a forum selection clause saying that all disputes arising about the sweepstakes, uh, that the California state courts had exclusive jurisdiction of those. 
So how to reconcile the issues? Um, plaintiffs sued Coinbase uh, over uh, issues with the sweepstakes. Coinbase moved to compel arbitration, citing the arbitration provision in the original user agreement. Plaintiffs resisted that. Uh, and as a, at a higher level, Coinbase said that this dispute over whether, so there was a dispute about whether an arbitrator or a court should decide, should this even be arbitrated? In other words, um, did the uh, forum selection clause in the sweepstakes rules override the arbitration clause in the original terms of service? So who decides that question? The Ninth Circuit said that a court decides that question. And the reason why, and this is, I, I found the Ninth Circuit's reasoning pretty hard to understand, and I think the Supreme Court isn't likely not to be impressed by it. And, you know, interestingly, the plaintiffs have run away from the Ninth Circuit's reasoning in their briefing in the Supreme Court. But what the Ninth Circuit said is that if the forum selection clause sending uh, matters to California state courts and the arbitration clause, had those been in the same contract, then an arbitrator would have had to decide whether the uh, matter is subject to arbitration. But because there was one contract with an arbitration clause and a delegation provision, and then a later contract that didn't have either of those, then a court had to decide it because the issue was the existence of an arbitration clause rather than its scope. That reasoning is faulty in my opinion. Um, in other words, whether a subsequent contract has modified or altered an arbitration clause and a delegation clause in an earlier contract is a question about arbitrability. In other words, have the parties agreed to have an, uh, uh, an arbitrator decide that question? And therefore, an arbitrator needs to resolve that question. Uh, the arbitrator might agree with the plaintiffs and say, no, no, the later sweepstakes rules have superseded the um, earlier terms of service such that this dispute's not subject to arbitration, but that threshold arbitrability question uh, is for the arbitrator and not the court. I think that's what the Supreme Court here is likely to hold. Um, one wrinkle is that back in the 90s, so there, there's two interpretive rules that are in some tension. The Federal Arbitration Act set forward a national public policy favoring arbitration, um, that was back in the 1920s in response to judicial reluctance to enforce arbitration clauses. And that judicial reluctance, as I mentioned at the beginning, has continued, especially in California. Um, so there's a federal policy favoring arbitration. And that means all doubts about whether a dispute should be arbitrated are resolved in favor of arbitrability. But in the, in the 1990s, the Supreme Court said that the issue about arbitrability, the who decides the arbitrability question, in other words, the arbitrator or a court, there is no presumption in favor of arbitrators deciding arbitrability. To the contrary, there's a presumption that courts decide arbitrability issues absent uh, unmistakable evidence that the parties intended the arbitrator to decide those issues. Uh, so those two principles are in some tension. Uh, because ultimately what the Supreme Court has repeatedly said is that all of this is a matter of party consent. What did the parties mean to do? Uh, and here, the original uh, terms of service are very clear, clear and unmistakable, that the arbitrator needs to decide all questions about the existence of an arbitration clause. But then the later sweepstakes uh, terms of service don't say anything about arbitration, don't say anything about who decides arbitrability. They just say California state courts handle this litigation. So the, the, there's an issue there. Where if the court rules against uh, the defense in this case, I expect it to rely on the rule that clear and unmistakable evidence of delegation is necessary for an arbitrator to resolve arbitrability issues. Uh, but, but ultimately, I would expect uh, Coinbase to prevail in this case. Uh, I would also expect uh, the court to reject the Ninth Circuit's approach, uh, where if these two uh, inconsistent provisions were in one contract, an arbitrator would resolve it, but because they're spread across two contracts, uh, a court has to resolve it. And, and the reason I say that this case is deceptively important is it's very common for parties in business um, with uh, to have repeated contracts over the course of their relationship. And while ideally parties would be clear and consistent in all of their contracts, that's not how the real world works. And so how uh, courts should handle this 
and whether the presumption in favor of arbitration melts away if parties have gotten a little sloppy in subsequent contracts um, is, is a question that impacts uh, businesses and consumers across the economy. Well, I'll be looking I, forward to seeing how the Supreme Court resolves it. Yes, I'd like to say it's not sloppiness in later contracts. It was just a sweepstakes. Uh, but we will, uh, we're going to breeze through the questions presented in the other four cases that are going to be argued um, here in February. And then we'll give our panelists some time to ask each other questions. And hopefully that gives you all, our audience, um, a chance to submit your burning questions as well. And then we'll turn to audience Q&A. So the next four cases we've got um, with their questions presented are Bissonette versus LePage Bakeries, which presents whether the Federal Arbitration Act's exemption for the employment contracts of, quote, workers engaged in interstate commerce applies to any worker who is, quote, actively engaged in the interstate transportation of goods, or whether the worker's employer must also be in the, quote, transportation industry. Uh, then we've got Warner Chapel Music versus Neely, which asks whether copyright plaintiffs can recover damages for acts that allegedly occurred more than three years before they filed their lawsuit. Uh, next, we've got Ohio versus EPA, which has two questions. Full disclosure, my husband, Elliot Geyser, is the SG of Ohio. His office is engaged on this case. Uh, so question one, whether the court should stay the Environmental Protection Agency's Federal Emissions Reduction Rule, the Good Neighbor Plan, and two, whether the emissions controls imposed by the rule are reasonable regardless of the number of states subject to the rule. And finally, we have McIntosh versus U.S., which asks whether a district court can enter a criminal forfeiture order when the time limit specified in the federal rules of criminal procedure has already passed. So uh, very exciting stuff on the docket. Uh, and I think that Professor Duffy has a question for a fellow co-panelist. So Professor Duffy. Yes. Uh Thank you. Um, so I was wondering about the bump stock case. Um, and uh, the question is for uh, Mr. Halbrook, obviously. Um, one of the things that I don't think appeared in the briefing, although you probably know more than uh, more than I do, but a quick search could not find it, is the, uh, I understand the absence of Chevron deference for multiple reasons that the government ha would have serious trouble with that claim, not the least of which is that the government seems likely to, or the Chevron doctrine might very well be overruled um, this term. But Skidmore deference, which is applicable when Chevron is inapplicable, seems kind of relevant here. And, and, and I think a lot of court observers think that kind of deference, to the extent it can be called that, is, is might very well survive. But that turns on the consistency of the government and looks really to agency pronouncements, you know, that are roughly contemporaneous with the statute or or with the issue arising. And it seems to me that Skidmore deference helps the respondents here. In other words, the gun owners who are against the government because the government took the position that this kind of bump stock was not a machine gun for at least, I believe, a decade and maybe longer across multiple administrations when this issue came up. I'm just wondering is why, why, why do you think that the that issue or, or the issue, I mean, I know the issue is brief that the government did take, you know, the contrary position that's mentioned all over the briefs, but why, why not try to fold that into an administrative law doctrine that's a good vehicle for it? Well, um, as I said, originally ATF had, um, in the final rule commentary, um, appealed to Chevron deference just straight out. And uh, e even though they also said that the statute is clear, and in fact, in the normal course of affairs, since it's a criminal law, you would normally, if ATF caused a prosecution of someone um, for a machine gun, and it turned out to be a bump stock, that would be a jury question as to whether um, it, it fired automatically more than one shot with a single function of the trigger. And so in the criminal law field, normally we're not involved with these deference doctrines, whether Skidmore or, or 
above that. And so um, it, it does creep into the court's decision sometimes that uh, the the case that that I find uh, interesting that's cited several times, including um, by both sides, was the um, uh, a, a case that Justice Kagan um, ha had written the opinion. Um, Slip my mind at the moment. Uh, uh, Anyway, oh yeah, Brinsky, Brinsky. The funny thing about that case was uh, ATF had taken a position at one point uh, as to what it meant to engage in the business of dealing in firearms and then retreated from that and took a, a broader point. And so this was a criminal prosecution. And although the courts, the majority in the court's decision in the Brinsky uh, took a broad view of what that term meant, um, the court said that we really don't care what ATF's opinion is. Uh, criminal laws are for courts to decide, not for uh, agencies or for um, the, the executive branch. And so it's kind of ironic that was an expansive case. But on the other hand, um, it rejected any kind of deference to uh, the agency opinion. Uh, another case, United States versus Apple, APEL, had a clear statement about that. Justice Scalia. Um, uh, wrote that in, in different opinions, concurring and majority. And um, we don't defer to the government's interpretation of a criminal statute. They're prosecuting the case. And so that's why I, I think um, what, what the, uh, the cargo um, folks did in this case in terms of their brief and, and also the briefs that were filed uh, as amicus briefs in support, uh, I, I really didn't see any references to these deference doctrines, either light or heavy, um, it, uh, you know, uh, other than as, as an aside, I mean, they were emphatic that either it's not a machine gun or if there's an ambiguity, the rule of lenity applies. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that. So with that, we'll turn to audience questions. Please feel free to continue submitting those. Um, the first question is from Robert Fitzpatrick and was asked during Professor Duffy's presentation. Uh, he asks, is RICS questionable? It's a big case for employment discrimination cases under Title VII. I believe he's referring to Delaware State College versus RICS, which is a 1980 SCOTUS case. Professor Duffy or anyone else? Um, I'm not I'm not familiar with uh, with that, so I'm not I, I might pass it on to to others. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not sure about the applicability of that. All right, fair. I mean, you were only asked about the February cases uh, here in 2024. Uh, so we will go on to the second audience question. And if Mr. Fitzpatrick would like to provide some clarification, we'll see if we can get an answer there. Um, Anonymous uh, has a question for Mr. Halbrook. Do you think that Justice Gorsuch's robust embrace of the rule of lenity in Wooden last year, a case construing the Armed Career Criminal Act, would incline him to be sympathetic to the petitioner's view that these administrative changes to the rules amount to a major change in criminal law, boldly shifting the legal slash illegal line. Well, so um, Gorsuch is a, is a friend of the rule of lenity. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, not so much so. Uh, Gorsuch actually weighed in on the very issue that's before the court now in a case called uh, Goody's from the D.C. Circuit. You had a two-to-one opinion um, uh, holding, uh, basically denying a preliminary injunction against enforcement of the new rule. Um, Judge uh, Karen Henderson actually dissented. She usually votes the other way in gun cases. But um, when the court uh, denied the cert petition on the preliminary injunction denial, uh, Gorsuch put in a statement uh, the way judges put in. You know, it was not a dissent from denial of uh, the petition, um, but it was a statement. And um, he said that this idea of um, 
deference to the government in criminal cases is just is impossible in our system. And he's been, of course, he's been on a um, a rampage against the deference rule anyway. And when he was in the Tenth Circuit, uh, you had the same thing where you had a, an agency saying one thing, a different administration comes in and they say the opposite, and we're supposed to defer to those. So um, I I think we we're likely to get a clear statement about the applicability of uh, any kind of deference rule in criminal cases. And um, I, I don't want to predict the outcome on the merits. Uh, the court could on the merits say that, well, bump stock is a machine gun or it's not. But I, I think some of these issues are going to be clarified in terms of deference, uh, also interpretive versus legislative rules and, and so forth. Great. Thank you. Uh, we can hold it open for another minute or so on questions. Uh, uh, and Professor Duffy, if you uh, want to go back to the question on RICS, we'll do that first. Yes, I, I did. I didn't realize that question was directed at me um, because this, this is an older case. I, I think it's important to see that this is a case interpreting a statute of limitations. And actually, it's a, it is a statute of repose that is in Title VII. So that statute reads that um, the um, that the uh, the complaint in the case, if you're going to sue on an employment discrimination or unlawful employment practice, it has to occur within 180 days after the alleged unlawful employment practice occurred. And that's one of the many statutes that are that are drafted as statutes of repose. Um, so there's a lot of discussion in the briefing about other statutes that are drafted that way that look explicitly to the time of challenged action. And I think the the petitioner says, well, look, Congress knows how to draft such statutes. Look at this and this and there's and that's a statute dealing with private litigation between uh, two parties. Because ultimately, though, there's an administrative agency there involved, the litigation that, it, that that this is a time limit on is litigation between two private parties, the uh, employee and the, the employer who engaged in the unlawful employment practice. But there's many administrative law statutes that are uh, framed in terms of a time limit that begins to run at the time of the alleged unlawful agency action. Now, the petitioner says, well, you know, <laughs> Those statutes show that Congress knows how to write a different time limit. And, you know, where they're applicable, we have no beef about that. But this has a different rule. The government has a kind of interesting argument that, well, because there's a lot of these um, uh, statutes and uh, in the administrative law context, and this particular statute is kind of borrowed. It's a general statute that applies generally that maybe the court could kind of adjust its terms to fit the administrative context and then have the concept of when a when a, uh, a cause of action first accrues to be whenever any a particular person can sue or at least at the time of agency action. So that that's a an argument that's talked about but I think both sides would say where congress has written statutes that are are drafted as statutes of repose that which basically look to the the uh, defendant's actions, the defendant's challenged actions, um, that this case won't disturb those. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, proving, I guess, that bump stocks are, in fact, the sexiest issue that we have going on this month. Um, another question for Mr. Halbrook. NSSF, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, has petitioned the Supreme Court to consider Barnett versus Raul, a case challenging Illinois' 2023 gun ban. Might the court be less likely to take up this case given its consideration of another firearm case dealing with bump stocks? Well, the, the case out of Illinois, uh, it, it's one out of several from that state and also from um, Maryland, from um, uh, California, the states with so-called assault weapon bans. Um, there's a lot of activity in the courts of appeals. Uh, some of these are just preliminary injunction issues. Some of them are merits. And uh, you're, you're definitely seeing people knocking on the Supreme Court's door with cert petitions on those issues. Um, one of the cases uh, when, when 
2022, the court decided uh, the New York versus Bruin case, they uh, vacated and, and remanded uh, the Maryland assault weapon ban to the Fourth Circuit, and the court still has it ruled, and it's been uh, over a year since oral argument, and uh, so the, there has been a petition filed in that case, uh, either you know, decide this case Supreme Court or tell them to render an opinion quickly. So um, uh, we realize they only want to do so many firearm cases at a time. And, and of course, the Rahimi case is pending in the Supreme Court in terms of the criminal prohibition on a person with a um, domestic violence restraining order uh, in terms of its validity because it was declared void by the Fifth Circuit. And so they've got that case, they've got other criminal cases coming up. So it's hard to predict what they're going to want to do. Um, some of these cases are Second Amendment cases, but others are overreaching by ATF cases in terms of the onslaught of uh, regulatory actions that have been taken, particularly in this administration. So it's uh, I can't read the tea leaves on what the court's going to do next, but there's a lot of firearm related cases um, pending and that people want to have the Supreme Court decide them. All right, well, we'll keep our eyes peeled on those. Uh, and I think we now have a question on net choice uh, coming from one of our own panelists. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so I was a bit surprised to read the reply briefs from net choice today because they went hard, much harder than they did in their opening briefs on Zotter not being applicable in this context. And I that's the entire amicus brief I filed in those cases was arguing why the Supreme Court should not apply Zotter. Um, so I'm wondering, Allison, whether you think there's a chance that the court considers that issue or are they going to just assume that Zotter applies? Yeah, I think that's an interesting um, question. I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't talk that much about the um, parts of the state laws that require an explanation if action is taken on a piece of content, why it was taken on, on that piece of content, um, what part of the um, terms of service you know required that. Uh, again, that is an aspect of the state law that shows that the states don't really understand the wide variety of content moderation regimes that exist right now. And actually, I think the trend is going towards decentralized content moderation. And so what this state law would require is a platform like say Facebook, you know, let's, let's use an, an example of the, one of those where it would be problematic. Facebook should be able to tell you why your piece of content was actioned on. Now, it's it's very hard to do. I know from professional experience for them to do that, but if they were required by law, they would probably come up with a more abbreviated process and be able to do that. But when you've got um, a platform like Reddit, where the content moderation is done largely by thousands of volunteers, Reddit is then legally in the position of trying to explain what happened to a piece of content actioned by the administrator of a subreddit related to donuts in Alabama. And that administrator may be just simply saying, you know, this person was being a harassing person that day. And do I remember exactly what they said? Well, no, but I administer my little subreddit about donuts and this is the task you've given me. So that's gonna suddenly be, you know, Reddit, Reddit, headquarters responsibility, it just, it doesn't work. Um, so, you know, Zouderer is, you know, are there, you know, for compelled speech situations where um, there's a state interest in having um, that speaker have to say that stuff. Um, I don't think that works in, in this context. Um, but again, I, I remain troubled that this is a pre-enforcement challenge because the fact situation among the platforms is so messy um, and changing. I mean, the move towards decentralized content moderation is real, and it has lots of implications, not just in this case, but in the job owning case, because the state's not going to be interested in job owning the lady with, with the donut subreddit. Um, and that's where I think a lot of this is headed. And uh, 
I don't know. I so yes. Um, Zouderer has been argued. I don't think it applies. Even if it does apply, I don't know what that does because it's not possible to do the things that they're being asked to do. All right, well, uh, we're all looking up the donuts in Alabama subreddits right now. Uh, but I think, John, you have a question about Bissonette. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, Scott, whether you think that this is going to continue the trend in um, the Southwest Airlines case of the court um, broadly construing the Section 1 exception um, for transportation workers or whether you think the court granted cert in this case kind of to limit the damage that it did in Saxon? I am very curious to see. I don't know. Um, I, I, I would imagine the latter, but this one could go either way. All right, and Professor Duffy, um, another word on Barnett and the Second Amendment? Yes, I'm my co-author, co frequent co-author, and I are are actually working on a paper on the Second Amendment. So I'm I've been following the litigation in Illinois, which which challenges um, a, a a ban on semi-automatic weapons. Um, and um, the the petition was just filed this week, so there's there's lots of time for this for this to play out. Um, the response is due March 15th. So you'd think that cert petition would be acted upon this term later this term. That might not be true. The, the state might seek a extension of time. That's not uncommon uh, to respond. Um, I think the court is going to approach these issues very cautiously. Um, they took a long time to get to the, a decision in the Bruin case. They do not seem especially eager to take up um, very big Second Amendment questions without allowing some percolation in the lower courts. Um, so I, I think that they might be skeptical to rush into what is a very big uh, question. Whereas, uh, for example, the Rahimi case, which is a, a, a case dealing with the Second Amendment rights of, of people who've been subject to domestic violence uh, orders, I think the court is I think and just listening to the oral argument, reading the transcript of the oral argument, that the, the court is quite serious uh, about what it said in a footnote in Bruin that that um, the state can take uh, the state or the government can take uh, action to try to limit the Second Amendment rights to people who are both law abiding and responsible. It's actually an interesting phrase that the court used, not just law abiding, but responsible. So there's an additional filter there. And, and obviously, and during the oral argument, at one point, the Chief Justice sort of, I think, sort of exploded and said, you know, that he the, the, the advocate for the gun owner said, well, you know, it depends upon how you define, you know, law abiding or dangerous, dangerous. And the Chief Justice, well, let's start with shooting at people, you know, shooting at innocent people uh -huh. that that might be considered dangerous. Um, and I think that you know, oftentimes it's hard to read the tea leaves and oral argument, but I, I think that the Chief Justice and, and some of the other justices probably think that people are sort of who are sort of proven dangerous in in some sort of process, um, or at least not responsible, um, might be uh, might be subject to restrictions on their Second Amendment rights. Um, but uh, it's a much bigger question to ask this this. I think very difficult question where you have machine guns, which which have been uh, limited in ownership uh, since the 1980s. Uh, they're not actually banned, but new machine guns can't be owned under federal law. So they seem to be outside of the core protection of the Second Amendment. Handguns obviously are in, um, and semi-automatic weapons. That's a lot of states are thinking about how to regulate them. Illinois has gone pretty far with, with a, a pretty significant restriction. So I think the court's going to really balk at, um, at taking up that question without seeing what states can do to um, perhaps promote responsible ownership um, and uh, in with these fairly dangerous weapons. So that's my prediction, but... Um, We'll find out by you know uh, the you know the early summer when the court makes its last grants or uh, the first um, 
the first conference in September. Could, could I just add to that? Um, after Bruin, what the court did with several of these cases that it had been holding was simply to grant, vacate, and remand. And that's what might well happen. Uh, Rahimi calls into question the historical test that, that Bruin instated. And so instead of taking more cases, I, I tend to agree that um, what the court may do is to apply its jurisprudence further in the Rahimi case and then send some of these other cases back to the circuit courts of appeal. And not to mention that the Illinois litigation, that's only at the preliminary injunction stage. That's not on the merits or haven't been trials on the merits. Uh, one other thing about the Rahimi argument, I'll just mention there was a little bit of humor when uh, General Prelegar started her argument and mentioned these two concepts of law-abiding and dangerous. Um, the Chief Justice asked, well, um, if I go 30 in a 25-mile zone, am I law-abiding? And she said, well, it really only applies to felonies, which um, raised an instant question because the provision after the uh, domestic violence provision is misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence. And so that's going to be cited by the criminal defense bar in terms of her, her answer to that. Then the other part was the, the dangerous uh, prong. And um, I, I'm sorry, the irresponsible prong. You have to be law-abiding and responsible. And she argued that, well, okay, um, not being responsible means you're dangerous. But but in terms of not being responsible, the Chief Justice asked, so if I don't put my recycling out on Wednesday night when I'm supposed to, am I responsible? So we got a lot of laughs out of those two questions in the court. Yeah, but I think technically that, yeah, I, you're right to say that the court might remand based on whatever they write in, in, remand, in Rahimi. It, it, it seems like, you know, many of the cases in Bruin that they remanded, you're like, really, why do you remand on this case? But I think that there that is consistent with their slow roll approach to these cases. Right. Well, uh, on the topic of law abiding and responsible, we've got six lawyers here who came in a whopping 12 minutes under time. So we promised you a seat at the sitting in 90 minutes or less, and we delivered on the less. Nate, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Like a hot knife through butter. We, we made it all the way through. Uh, as advertised, an excellent uh, preview panel. Thanks to our speakers and our moderator, Alexandra Geyser. Uh, nicely done, everyone. Um, we look forward to our next opportunity to have each of you back to join us. Uh, as always, our audience uh, feedback can be sent to us by email at info at bedsock.org. With that, have a great day. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm.